OK. Let's go back to uh, now with this k in our pockets. Let's go back to the most important topic of study in spectral graph theory, which is this quadratic form. So we'll get back to this guy, uh, e of f, which is a half, the average over edges, the square difference of s values. OK, and uh, one of the first things I wrote on this board uh, today was after like a tiny bit of calculation, you see that this is the same as the uh, two norm of f squared, or f's inner product with itself, minus the expected value on a random edge, uv, of f of u, f of v. That's actually somehow we got started on this whole definition of k business. OK, so as we've now finally seen, this is the same thing as f inner product f minus uh, f inner product kf. Maybe these should equate these two things in your head. Uh, this f goes to this f, that f goes to that f. OK, so now, uh, well, inner products are linear, so we can write this as inner product of f with f minus kf. And I'll now write f as the matrix, the identity matrix times f. That doesn't do anything. And uh, now I can say this is the inner product of f with i minus k. It's the difference of two matrices times f. And having done this, this allows me to introduce, well, I don't want to say the last piece of notation, but one more uh, major player in spectral graph theory, this matrix. I mean, it's just a small tweak on k. You just subtract k from the identity matrix. But it has a special uh, honor and uh, glorified name, uh, L. It's basically the Laplacian of the graph. Actually, this differs a little bit from some people's definitions. Maybe they would call this the normalized Laplacian. So perhaps I'll call it that too. What if you ever heard this uh, discussion of like graph Laplacians as like uh, some key player in spectral graph theory? Well, now you've, you've met the object at hand. So, OK. Uh, this L, the identity matrix minus K, is, let's say, the normalized Laplace matrix or operator for G. Laplacian operator. And as always, you should, I mean, unless you're a real sophisticated, you should always go back and remember what's going on when G is a deregular graph, the most basic case. So the most basic case is uh, for deregular G. Well, we know that in that case, L is the identity matrix minus uh, K is just 1 over D times A. And let me just write this like this. It's um, 1 over D times D times the identity minus a. Okay. And this is object is a thing that is sometimes called the like unnormalized Laplacian. Or some people will just call it the Laplacian. Okay, so this is the, the matrix you get. You take the matrix, the adjacency matrix A, and you subtract it from uh, D times the identity matrix. You put these on the diagonals and you put like minus ones where there are edges. Uh, and um, this is all well and good, and it's like a fine thing to do and a great thing to study for regular graphs. But then, like, if you read like textbooks about like irregular graphs, they kind of ham and haw a little bit about uh, Laplacian in that case. And sometimes you see some crazy formulas with like a capital D to the minus one half matrix floating about everywhere, and it gets a little messy. So uh, that's why I like doing it the way I've done it here. And so uh, for this class, these will be our definitions. Um, OK, so just to be uh, clear, um, you know, this is a, a, a matrix or an operator. So it takes vectors to vectors or functions to functions. So uh, we could say, how does it operate? If you have a function f and you apply the Laplacian L to it, you get a new function LF. 
And what is LF's value? Well, by definition, LF at vertex u is, well, the identity applied to f, which is just f at u. So f u minus the kf thing, which is the expected value or average value on the neighbors of u of f of v. OK, so <clears throat> applying l to a function f is like you keep f, but at each vertex, you subtract the average of the neighbors. Any questions? You should have a question. You should be like, why? What, what is, why did you make this operator? And uh, I'll tell you the reason. What is the meaning of this operator? The meaning of this operator is it's that thing, L, such that inner product of F, L, F is this quadratic form. Okay? So the point is, we just love this quantity so much. It has a lot of great meanings, as we'll see. Uh, that we're like, hey, this is a very convenient formula for it. F inner product with LF, where L is, I don't know, this thing. So like this thing as is does not have like such an amazing meaning, but it's nevertheless elevated to like a high and lofty position because of this formula. So because we really care to study this, we end up studying like this matrix L a lot. Yeah, I don't really know who uh, Laplace was really either, other than a French mathematician. Or uh, this also connects to some other aspects of physical reality involving like, I don't know, uh, electrical networks and things, but I don't know anything about physics. Uh, great, yeah, so to me, like this L is like, um, uh, well, it's a thing that gives you this formula. E yeah, you'll also hear this, like, this terminology. It's also the infinitesimal generator of the like, continuous time random walk. Um, so you'll eventually see these formulas that look like e to the minus TL. This is like the, the continuous time analog of the standard random walk. Anyway, let's leave that and uh, think about um, this connection some more. In particular, uh, you know, it's supposed to be a class about computer science, so I'll sort of mention some kind of connection to a very famous and important problem in computer science, an algorithms problem, the sparsest cut problem, home of finding the, well, uh, sparsest cut in a graph. So let's take a look at that. Let's again take our favorite scenario where we have a subset of vertices S and F is the indicator function for S. Okay, so as we know, uh, well, the inner product of F and LF, this quadratic form of F, which uh, when you plug it into that formula, uh, it's the probability uh, when you choose a random edge uv, that u is in the set s and v is not in the set s. Okay, so this is sort of the, um, right, because you'll pick up a non-zero contribution here when uh, u is in and v is out or vice versa. Okay, and then this factor of half takes care of this directionality. So this is a, is a nice meaning. It's like the fraction of edges that are going from inside s to outside s the volume of the directed edges on the boundary of S. Um, and it's very nice to compare this to somehow the size of S, which I actually like to express this way, as we saw earlier in this lecture, the 2 norm squared of F, or the inner product of F with itself, the expected value, F of U squared, which is just the probability if you take a random U that U is in S. Okay, sometimes we call this the volume of S. And what's going to be nice is actually to look at the ratio of these two quantities. Because if you look at the ratio of these two quantities, then uh, on the right, you get a conditional probability. Okay, maybe it would be more clear if I wrote V naught in S and U in S up here. You see, in this case, the ratio, uh, inner product of F L F over inner product of F F, is the probability when you choose a uniformly random edge, U to V, that V is not in S, conditioned on U being in S. Okay, so it's like the probability, if you pick 
a random uh, u from the set S, I mean, uh, with probability proportional to the degree. And then you do one step that you get out of, I mean, this is terrible notation, but that you get out of S. OK, uh, so there's a number between 0 and 1. And you might think of it as like the like, escaping probability for the set S. So like, uh, imagine you're doing a random walk. And I tell you at a certain time that you're in the set S. And this quantity represents the probability that you'll get out of S in the next step. Okay, you could imagine that if S is a set where this ratio is small, it's a piece of the graph where if you're doing the random walk, you'll have a tendency to get stuck in this piece. If I just tell you you're inside the set of vertices S and you're doing a random walk, then the one step will uh, be unlikely to get you outside S. So a set S where this is a uh, quantity as small is like a, a bottleneck for random walks in this graph. And it's also like a sparse cut, as it's sometimes called. It's like a piece of the graph, which is sparse in the sense that like, there are very few edges coming out of it relative to its own size. Okay. This quantity is sometimes called uh, the conductance of F, or sorry, of S. And sometimes denoted capital, denoted capital Phi of S. Uh, OK, and uh, for example, the, the famous sparsest cut problem in algorithms theory. It's just the task. I give you a graph G. Find the set S that minimizes this quantity. Well, it's not quite that, because uh, you could take S to be um, all the vertices. And then the escape probability for all the vertices is 0. Um, so generally, you want to look at, you know, if you have a set of vertices S, you should sort of, in the denominator, put either the size of s or the size of complement of s, whichever is smaller. That's like the fair way to compare. Or sometimes sparsest cut is just defined to be find the uh, set of vertices s of volume at most half that has the smallest conductance. And this is a very important problem in algorithms, especially for um, divide and conquer type algorithms on graphs. You can imagine if you had an algorithm that was great at finding a, the sparsest cut or a sparse cut in graphs, it could be very useful for divide and conquer type algorithms, right? I mean, you find a sparse cut, sort of means that at a very high level, you know, there's very few edges coming out of S relative to its size. Maybe you can recursively solve some problem, whatever you're interested in, on S and on S complements. And then maybe it's possible to somehow patch the two solutions together in a global solution to a global solution in a not too difficult way if there are not many edges connecting S and its complements. So that's the idea. I mean, one idea why the sparsest cut problem is important in algorithms. And what's uh, kind of uh, shocking and distressing is, uh, well, it's NP hard to find the sparsest cut, but it's much worse than this in the sense that we may be happy with <clears throat> an algorithm that returns a pretty sparse cut on a given graph. Maybe you don't have to find the sparsest cut. So you might be interested in an algorithm that always found uh, efficiently a set S whose conductance with, within factor 2 of minimum, or factor 3 of minimum, or factor 10 of minimum. Uh, but for all these problems I just said there, we don't know if they're in P and we don't know if they're NP hard, which is a very distressing situation to be in. Um, because we're supposed to have this great theory of complexity theory in algorithms, and to not know if something is NP or NP hard is very bad. Uh, so it's like famously known that you can um, find the small, set of smallest conductance up to a factor of square root log n in polynomial time, or up to the square root of the value itself. We'll see that next lecture, hopefully. Uh, but on the other hand, like it's only known that to find a, a set that minimizes the conductance up to a factor of 1.0000001 is NP hard. Or maybe it's not even NP hard, but it's like hard assuming NP is not in some exponential time or something. Uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, so we know very little about the complexity of solving this problem. Yep? Um, so, sorry, kind of backtracking. Uh -huh. Why is it the case that the same of S is equal to the probability that U and S can be a counterpart? 
Oh, yeah, we did this at some point, but I guess you can see it sort of from this formula here. If f is the indicator of a set s, so s values are either 1 or 0, you pick a random edge. If the two endpoints are both in the set or both outside the set, you'll get 0 here. If one's in the set and one's outside the set, then the difference squared will be 1. Uh, and you'll count uh, half. But um, so it's sort of half the probability that a random edge has one vertex inside and one vertex outside. Or you can say that, oh, I want the first, it's exactly the probability that the first vertex is inside and the second vertex is outside. Yeah. Great. So that's a bit of uh, algorithmic uh, motivation. And the scenario here is that we have this quantity that we sort of care about a lot. and. Uh, if f is the indicator of a set of vertices, a 0, 1 function, then it's exactly equal to this ratio. And this ratio gets studied a lot in linear algebra, as you may know. It's related to the eigenvalues of L. And in fact, there's a polynomial time algorithm for finding like, uh, the f that minimizes or maximizes this ratio. The trouble is it might not find a 0, 1 valued function. So you can't use that polynomial time algorithm to find the best uh, smallest conductance s. Although again, next time when we talk, uh, hopefully I'll mention Cheeger's inequality, it'll tell you some way to kind of overcome this. But uh, let's get into that uh, eigenvalue business uh, now, even if it's not necessarily immediately going to help us solve this uh, sparsest cut problem. OK, so let's get into. Uh, questions about like minimizing or maximizing this thing, which is related to minimizing and maximizing uh, this quantity subject to you know, some scaling condition about the f's. It's going to be a little bit easier to uh, talk about it at first if we talk about um, maximizing this numerator, even though in sparsest cut you're more interested in minimizing it. Somehow just be uh, more convenient. And what I basically want to do over the next, uh, or most of the rest of this lecture, is um, just talk about uh, well the connections between this and eigenvalues. So let's go back to this question about maximizing uh, this curly E, the quadratic form of f, which we now know has this formula related to L, f inner product L f. Uh, which is this quantity, half expectation, you draw an uv and edge, a few minus fv squared. I should mention, by the way, like the, this is, I mean, in the, especially in the regular case, this is like, you know, you have like the row version of f times l times the column version of f. This is maybe the way, the matrix vector way to picture it. Um, at least this would be if you had the standard inner product. OK, so. Uh, Let's say we're interested in maximizing this. And as you know, we need some kind of scaling condition to make sense of this. So subject to the 2 norm squared of f, or f inner product f, or the expected value of f squared being uh, 1. OK, so a little bit of math talk here. Uh, in some sense, we have a quantity we're trying to maximize, which is a function of n real unknowns, the n values of f. It's this quantity. It's some quadratic quantity. So it's a continuous function of these n unknowns. And uh, subject to this condition that these n quantities squared when averaged equals 1, uh, this means that they all lie on an ellipsoid. But anyway, it's a, a compact set. So for some math talk, we're maximizing a, uh, a continuous function on a compact set, and therefore by calculus, a maximizer exists. So in this problem, a uh, maximizer exists. And let's give it a name, phi. OK, so it's a function, 2 norm squared 1, that maximizes this quantity. And here is a claim I would like to make, and we'll probably prove this claim. Uh, 
This function phi has a very funny property. If you hit it with L and form L phi, you get a new vector which is parallel to phi. Okay, and this is L phi equals lambda times phi for some L, for some uh, lambda. Um, okay, so well, for people in the linear who remember their linear algebra well, this means that uh, phi is an eigenvector, or sometimes called eigenfunction in this case, because vector and function are synonymous for us, an eigenvector uh, of the matrix L. So we'll prove this claim in a second, but let's deduce some facts about it. Um, good. So uh, once we know this, then uh, we can say something about this number, lambda. So this all-important quadratic form uh, applied to this maximizer phi. Well, it's phi inner product L phi, but this is just phi inner product lambda phi. And the inner product is linear, so this is lambda times phi phi. And that's lambda because the normalization condition is that this norm number is 1. Uh, OK, so this maximizer phi has the property that when you hit it with L, you get a scalar multiple of phi. And that scalar multiple is the actual quadratic form value for this phi. Um, and it's the maximum one, and we know actually by some theorem we proved last time, and I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, that this number is actually between 0 and 2. And I want to make one more observation about it. Uh, actually, I won't maybe fully do the proof, but it's an easy fact to verify that this maximizer will have another nice property, which is that its average value across the vertices will be 0. Or another way of putting that is that uh, the inner product of phi with the constantly 1 function is 0. Because right? the inner product of phi with the constantly 1 function is this, by definition. Or if you want to think in geometric terms, phi as a vector is perpendicular to the constant 1 function, at least with respect to this funny inner product. And. Uh, let me just say the proof in words. If you don't fully get it, then uh, it's OK. It's something like we talked about last time. It's just that, um, let's say you have some maximizer phi for this little program here. Um, and imagine its expectation is not 0, some other value, mu. Then imagine replacing phi by phi minus that expectation, phi minus a constant, the constant being its expectation. Well, uh, on one hand, that does not change the, the quadratic form applied to phi. Because if you just subtract the constant from a function everywhere, then it just cancels out here. So it does not change this quadratic form. But it's not hard to convince yourself uh, if you take a function and uh, subtract it, its mean from itself, it makes the 2 norm go down. I mean, in fact, if you subtract the mean from itself, it makes the 2 norm or the expected square become equal to the variance, which is always less. So subtracting a mean from the function doesn't change this, but sort of like only improves this and sort of in the sense of helping you in the sense of making the 2-norm squared smaller. And then if it becomes smaller than 1, you can multiply it by a scalar multiple to make its expected square go back up to 1 and make this bigger. So I said that in a funny roundabout way, but um, hopefully you more or less buy it. But I just want to remember this easy to deduce fact that the maximizer will have the property that it's, uh, it makes a 0 inner product with the all 1s vector. OK. Uh, let me prove this claim. I think we have time. OK, so why would the maximizer phi for this program have the property that uh, L phi is parallel to phi? Uh, this proof I'll show you is basically like Lagrange multiples, although I wouldn't, um, Lagrange multipliers, although I won't really say that, except just now. Uh, for the claim, okay, so assume for the sake of contradiction that uh, phi and L phi are not parallel. Oops. Okay, they're not parallel. Okay, so the picture in your head is like here's phi. Uh, here is uh, maybe uh, L phi. Okay, and they're not parallel. So you can drop a perpendicular here. 
making a right angle. And I'm going to call psi the unit vector in this perpendicular direction. Okay, so psi is unit vector in this uh, picture's perpendicular direction. Okay, and it's, uh, that's not nonsensical by virtue of the fact that we're assuming they're not parallel. Okay, so it's a well-defined direction. Okay, now let uh, epsilon be a small non-zero number to be named later. And we're going to consider uh, f being uh, phi, the putative maximizer, plus a little bit of this orthogonal direction, psi. And uh, we're going to get a contradiction to the optimality of phi eventually. So one thing that we can tell is that the uh, squared length of this new f I'm considering is basically 1. In fact, it's exactly 1 plus epsilon squared by Pythagoras. Pythagorean theorem, uh, because phi and psi are orthogonal. Uh, and now let's look at uh, what you would get if you tried f up here. Well, OK, f and LF in inner product, by definition, it's phi plus epsilon psi, <coughs> inner product with L phi plus epsilon L psi. OK, so let's break this up. Uh, we get phi and L phi. And then we get uh, 2 epsilon inner product of phi and L psi. See, we actually get like phi and L psi. And then here we get like L phi and psi. But these are actually the same because L is self-adjoint because k is self-adjoint, which means you can move k back and forth across inner products and it doesn't change things. And that's also true of the identity matrix i. You can move it back and forth across inner products without changing things. And so it's true of i minus k, which is L. Good. And then, OK, there's one more term, which is epsilon psi inner product epsilon L psi. I will just write that this is plus big O of epsilon squared. So I'll think of all these vectors, phi, psi, as fixed, but epsilon is really going to 0. So I don't know, psi inner product L psi is some number. But anyway, it's multiplied by an epsilon squared. OK. So now, uh, if we look at this ratio, f, l, f over inner product of f, f, uh, well, I just divided this number by the squared norm of f, which is 1 plus epsilon. So I basically just divided it by 1. So I basically didn't do anything. I mean, I did something, but also only up to order epsilon squared. So uh, even this divided by 1 plus epsilon squared, this divided by 1 plus epsilon squared, it's only changing this by order epsilon squared. Yep. This one? Yeah. Yeah, it's really, I mean, if you expand this out, it's really you get uh, one copy of phi and epsilon L psi. Well, I move the epsilon out here. And you also get like one copy of psi and epsilon L phi. So let me move the epsilons out. But this, this like long story I said in words, I was claiming that this thing is equal to this thing which is also this thing. Okay, This is just because you can switch the two elements in inner product. This thing is subtle, but it follows from this fact that I verified before that the matrix K, and therefore also the matrix L, is self-adjoint, which basically means you can do this move. So it's the, uh, if everything was uh, the regular case, then L would be a symmetric matrix, and then this would be um, obvious if you wrote it down. Uh, yeah, so I did that move a little bit fast. OK, so I guess what I'm saying is um, uh, I, I looked at this ratio because if you have a general f whose 2 norm squared is not necessarily 1, then basically you know, what you want to look at is the ratio of this to this. Because okay? you can always scale f by a constant and make it achieve 
uh, this quantity. OK, so if I replaced f by f divided by square root of this, then the f that I've made here would be achieving this much in the quadratic form. But now the point is, this was supposedly the maximum possible value you could achieve. Uh, and the other point is, this number is not 0 by the picture. Oh, I should have, OK. So this, let me use that self-adjointness again to say that this is uh, L phi and psi. So now it's like the inner product between L phi, which is this thing, and psi, which is this thing, which by definition is not 0. So this is a number which is not 0. And so you can see, like, regardless of whether this is positive or negative, if you choose the sign of epsilon appropriately and make epsilon real small, you can make this number get bigger than this number. And this order epsilon squared will not screw that up if you make epsilon small enough. So if you make epsilon really tiny, then you can really neglect this. But by choosing the sign of epsilon right, you can make this whole number get bigger than the supposed optimum. So that's the end of that proof. OK, so uh, great. So I'm almost ready to put this all together into the statement of the key theorem called the spectral theorem, which will finally get us to the eigenvalue, eigenvector story, which we can then uh, study in the last spectral graph theory lecture. Uh, good. So now, I mean, implicitly, we found the maximizer with some function or vector phi. It was parallel to L phi. It had this mean 0 thing. So now let's just resolve the maximization problem, but disallow phi as a solution. And what I really mean is disallow all the vectors perpendicular or orthogonal, all the vectors parallel to phi. So resolve the problem, but maximize over uh, the same conditions and also the condition of being orthogonal to phi. So now I want to say consider a similar thing, a similar problem. Maximize uh, f inner product LF subject to the same condition before, f inner product f should be 1, but also f should be orthogonal to uh, phi, the solution we just found. I'm trying to sort of get a, like a new solution. Well, this is still the same quadratic function, and this is still a compact set. Now it's like an ellipsoid intersected with like a hyperplane, but uh, okay, it's still a compact set, so it has some other solution. So this, you can repeat the whole same argument. I just did. And you'll get some other, like some new maximizing function, phi prime. And you can do the same argument. And it'll have a property that uh, L phi prime is, again, parallel to phi prime for some lambda prime. And this lambda prime will again be like the maximal value achieved here. So it would have to be at most lambda, because lambda was like the real, real maximizer. And this is like the new maximizer when you disallow stuff parallel to phi. And it's also going to have uh, that its expectation is 0. Same argument. In other words, it's orthogonal to all one's vector as before. And now you can do it again. You can say, oh, I want to solve the same maximization problem subject to this two-norm condition. But I want to do it over the subspace of all things orthogonal to my first solution and orthogonal to my second solution, so kind of trying to find like a third like new solution. And you'll get like a new lambda, and it'll have all these properties. And you can keep repeating doing this, finding like the best maximizer in the remaining subspace. And they'll all be orthogonal to the all ones function slash vector. So when you kind of get down to the end, like the all ones direction will be the last direction left. And uh, actually, if you think about it, uh, if you apply L to the all ones function, remember L is the, the operator that takes a function and replaces the value of the function at a vertex u by its same value minus the average of its neighbors. So if you do that to the all ones function, everything gets replaced by 1 minus the average of its neighbors, which is also 1, which is 0. So uh, L applied to the all ones vector is the all zeros vector. Um, and this is sort of like the last maximizer you're left with. 
So sort of the, the last optimal value will just be 0. So I'll finally summarize uh, everything that you get out of this argument with uh, the theorem. Just kind of like the base theorem in this area, sometimes I think called the spectral theorem, or maybe the spectral theorem is a theorem that's related to this, but basically this is the main theorem. So it's this. Given an undirected G, there exists an orthonormal functions, or vectors, if you will. These are your phi's, and these are going to be eigenvectors or eigenfunctions for L. And we'll call them uh, phi 0, phi 1, up to phi n minus 1. This phi n minus 1 is actually the phi, the f like the first one. So the indexing is a little bit backwards. This is like the maximizer. This is the second maximizer. This is going to be the last maximizer. So in fact, uh, this phi 0 is always going to be the constantly 1 function. Uh, and they're orthonormal. So this is great because these are n vectors in an n-dimensional space. So they're like, a, they're like an orthonormal basis for the space. You can express every function as a linear combination of these orthonormal functions. And these are like the very special, great, superstar orthonormal basis functions for the graph G because they're eigenfunctions or eigenvectors of the Laplacian and also of K. Uh, and real numbers, associated real numbers, Lambda 0, lambda 1, up to lambda n minus 1. This last one, first one is 0. This last one is at most 2. This is the, the real optimizer optimizer. Just one second. Uh, I should actually write this. They're in ascending order here. That's the order. OK, such that, well, this last statement is just that they're uh, eigen uh, vectors. Such that L applied to phi i is lambda i phi i. OK, so L has a very nice action on phi i. It just scales it. OK, so basically, we've shown that in this nice setting of uh, an undirected graph, you have this like, most enjoyable linear algebra situation, like an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors, and all the eigenvalues are non-negative. OK, so next time we will see uh, the glorious synthesis of eigenvalues and uh, sparsest cut and other such things. <laughs>